And I would like to introduce our first speaker, Robert Ashton. He's um, been involved in numerous philanthropic projects, a best-selling author on Amazon, a champion of social enterprise, and um, particularly within Norfolk. Welcome, Robert. So now I know that I'm talking about nuts. I thought I was the only nut in Norfolk, and there's some more on the screen there. So I want to talk about just ordinary people that do extraordinary things. Because I, I worry a bit about social enterprise being kind of exclusive, that some people do, but not others. And philanthropy, the other kind of theme, is something that's done by loads of people, but again, not necessarily by all of us. So I want to talk about things that we can all do, and illustrate it with four people that I know. Is that okay? And to illustrate it, and I'll watch that the light, I've got four objects that kind of show, remind me what these people are all about. So I'll show the objects, then I'll talk, give some context, then I'll talk about the people, and then I should have my 80 minutes done. Yeah? So I'll give the objects one at a time, and I shall line them up down here to, to get you thinking. So the, the first person I'm going to talk about is illustrated by a can of Guinness, and his name is, um, is Terry. And before I over these, I shall curse. The second person is named Rebecca. And she lives in Brighton, and I've got my things caught up here. And, and she kind of, this is, this, is, this is Rebecca. The third person is called uh, Nancy. Note I've got a gender inequality now in favour of women. And I should illustrate her with my brand new iPad, of which I'm incredibly proud. And the third person is local, and uh, he's really interesting, and his name is David. And I'm going to illustrate him with this very, very Swiss piece of kit that I borrowed this morning from Breckland Funeral Service. And then the last object is actually particularly poignant because it kind of reminds us about the other element of all of this stuff, which is the word urgency. Because I reckon in 35 years' time, I will go from being, you know, as I know, fairly fit and healthy and active and, and, and nut, to being in one of those. And when you're in one of those, you can't do the stuff that you can do when you're here now. And I don't think any of us in this room have less than, say, 60 years between we go from where we are now to being where that, that thing might take us. So that's kind of... That's, that's kind of my starting point. Um, and then I went, I went running this morning on, on the way in, and um, this is kind of part in, on the way. But I found one of these really annoying things hanging on a, on a piece of hedge. Do you find those things like this? And, uh, and then do they piss you off like they do me? And did you realise that there are six million dogs in the UK? And when we talk about big society, you wonder, well, what would happen if every one of those six million dogs did a poo and it got slung in the head by some thoughtless individual like that? So, I just want to leave this here, I hope you can't smell it, just as a reminder of, of where I want to head to with this um, 18 minutes. And, and for me, that very ordinary object, from which I will now put some distance between me and it, I kind of I leave it over there near Harry, um, a friend I had and no longer had. It kind of says to me the attitude that pervades around the country right now. <laughs> I, just, I just knew it was going to do that. I hope no one's fiddled with that, actually. Because um, the person, people who throw things like that don't think about the, the repercussions. So how many, how many health and social services, how many old people go there at lunch because there are thousands of people picking those things up? How many kids end up in hospital with diseases because they've explored one of those things hanging in a hedge and found out what's inside it? And of course, well, what you know is that the dog owners who really do is put it in their pocket and take it home and uh, what they're doing, and I have no idea. So that's kind of some context, and, and so my four people are kind of the antithesis of that. They're people that decided that things like that are bad, and they would do something about it. And I call them activists, but these guys call them nuts. And so the first of these people um, drinks Guinness, he wears a flat cap, he's 72 years old, he has terminal cancer, his career has alternated between spraying ammonia in the faces of security guards, doing wage snatches, and being in prison, not surprisingly, uh, and he smokes 20 a day at least, and usually when I'm there with him, and he's kind of not my sort of person. And he's not the sort of conveniently comfortable person you expect to see as, as an activist. But Terry is very much an activist, because I met him in Colchester, where he lives. Uh, I met him in a part of Colchester where the regeneration project has gone wrong. Uh, I met him, he'd invited himself along to a, to a group where there were some councillors, some housing association, there were big blocks of flats, really nice, with shops at the bottom. There were derelict warehouses. There was a really nice business centre with no parking. Next door to a scrapyard and an Egyptian traveller site. And everybody's saying, oh, well, no one's doing anything. Nobody's making this work. It's all kind of falling apart. And Terry wasn't worried about the big picture. Terry, 
And all these people, in my experience, have one thing they're concerned about. Terry was concerned about a strip of land next to the river that he wants to make a garden. It currently has uh, fly-tipped uh, sanitary ware and some supermarket trolleys. And who knows what else. Terry wants it to be a garden. He took the trouble to find out about me, about what my connection with the place he lived. He made an emotional connection, which is really important. The best of these activist guys make an emotional connection with the people they think can help. And perhaps I became the person that made him a leader because um, I've now been working with him for six months and we've finally persuaded a whole load of people to get involved in making that regeneration project happen. And so, in the same way that... Um, did you ever see that film, Babel? Babel, where the, the, the kids shot somebody in Morocco and the repercussions went all around the world. So he did kind of that same kind of thing. He never imagined that I'd be talking to people, as I was yesterday, around spending tens of millions of pounds regenerating that part of town in Colchester, just so he can have his garden. And that's what it's all about for me. So my second person is very different to Terry. She's far more respectable, and she's the sort of person who could have been appointed to public office, uh, or elected to public office, or appointed as a, as a council uh, officer, or whatever. And, um, and, and she's, she's got young kids, which is why she has one of these, and she's really interested in, uh, well, she's really interested in swimming, really. And in Brighton, where she lives, there's a beautiful art deco 1930s classic listed uh, Lido, you know what they are, outdoor swimming pool, where people go and jump around and swim outside and, and it's all falling apart and it's all very tragic and a little bit sad. And, um, and Rebecca thought, actually, this would be really nice if this was saved. It would be really nice if the person that has the lease on it didn't choose to, um, didn't choose to knock it down and uh, build flats, although there are planning issues around that who didn't choose just to neglect it and let it fall down so that he can then build flats and make lots of money. And, and Rebecca just thought, well, let's do something about it. And Rebecca is as respectable as, as Terry is not in that Rebecca works in London, has a fantastic network. She's a professional marketer. So she used Facebook to get some interest in the Lido, and lots of people were interested. She, she ended up with 5,000 people living in a community of 10,000, all with posters in their windows. She then said about uh, talking to the council, who kind of did what councils often do, which is say, well, there are processes and protocols and, and process democracy if you talk to a local elected member and basically, you know, piss off and leave us alone. <laughs> and, um, and so she did a few clever, really clever things. She, she, she found out that if it was grade two star listed, it could go onto the at-risk register, which would mean that it would have to be repaired, brought up to standard, yeah? And she kind of did that through a process of, of lobbying and talking to different people. And so all of a sudden now, this LIDO is, is, is grade two star listed and on the at-risk register. So the council, being the council, kicked into action and um, decided that uh, it was going to cost 400 grand to repair this place. So they put like, one of those legal things on the leaseholder that says you've got to spend 400 grand and improve it. So the man who wants to knock it down is now faced with a 400,000 pound bill. Guess what that does for the value of the place? reduces it to zero. She then has a 50-page business plan put together with some really clever people in London, the best business plan I've ever seen, that shows how her and her community will create a new organisation to run this thing for the benefit of the people of her part of Brighton, Salt Lake. And, the, and she's done all of that, not because she had the right to do it, not because it was necessarily the right thing to do, but because she wants it to happen. Because kind of self-interest, she wants it for her kids and her neighbours. She wants her kids to swim in this place. She wants to be able to sit in a cafe with her neighbours and friends and talk about the stuff you talk about when your kids are swimming in the summer. And she even thought about how to make it profitable, as most swimming pools are not. And such that if you have a, a, an ice rink in the winter, it makes money. And in the summer, that money you made in the winter gets you subsidised the swimming in the summer. So two quite different people, but actually they've achieved the same result. They've both seen the need, become single, focused on single issue, and, and gone for it. But both from the outside of organisations. The, the third illustrated by the iPad that you can't possibly see, and now I can't because I'm standing in the light. Um, the, the iPad is to illustrate somebody called Nancy. And Nancy is interesting because Nancy actually works for an organisation. So Nancy has the right to, to be that change, to make that so happen. Nancy runs a, a planning charity in London, and planning is a really hot topic right now with kind of you know, change in regulations and localism and all that other stuff. 
And what makes Nancy one of those activists in my eyes is that Nancy has decided that rather than just going and getting another job when her government funding, the government funding for her organization kind of diminishes, she's going to go off and, and, and save it. And so she's like not responding to the usual stuff about, well, we'll just cut back, cut back, cut back until we disappear. She's fighting back. And she's doing that by building relationships with people she would never have built relationships with before, like a bank, like a, a, an airtime provider, a mobile phone company, like somebody who produces software that enables um, people to talk to their councils through their iPads and iPhones. And so where she's going in, in the face of localism, which is cutting her funding back, is she's actually creating a localism app which will enable everybody in the country to comment on what's going on around them in the world. <coughs> and so, because the other irony, the thing that really makes her mad, but all these people again, get mad, something makes them mad, yes, yeah? so mad because there's no garden, mad because the pool's closing, and mad because the government cut the money, and mad because when you're in London, the people that have the most to say about uh, development are the people that live in the leafy, lay, uh, leafy streets of Islington, and very articulate, and the people that always get the rough end of the deal, the people that always have the scrap yard on their doorstep are like the, the Somalis who arrived two, two, two years ago, don't speak English for a while, and they live in a rotting tenement down near the tent somewhere. And so that whole thing about equality has driven her to create a localism app, and she will generate income for her organisation by selling the data that that provides. And then my last is the, is the local one. And I'm really interested, actually, in, 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 in the journey that I will one day make from being here to being like that, and I guess some of you might have thought about that as well. Not a few years around as Rory, but if you're older, you certainly would have done. And, and did you know that in Norfolk, where we live, we are the only county that does not have independently funded and run hospice provision, apart from the children's hospice at Gwynham? 4% of people in the UK die in a hospice, unless they're in Norfolk. Really interesting fact, isn't it? The other interesting fact is that if you're born with something not quite right, the NHS does fix it. If, you, if, you, if you're dying and things aren't quite right, they don't fix it. 30, about 35% of hospice funding comes from the NHS, the rest is raised locally. And a guy called David, who lives in Great Yarmouth, who's the last of my subjects, da David so kind of picked up on this and he thought, well, why should that be? Why should we have you know, a hospice in, in, kind of a hospice provision in Norwich run by the NHS? The one in West Norfolk that's struggling to get off the ground. Huge need in Great Yarmouth, but nobody doing anything about it. And everybody said to him, it won't work. Everybody said to him, you can't raise that sort of money in Great Yarmouth. Everybody said, it's just, it's just not possible. People said, go away. It's kind of embarrassing having him making all that noise. But the other thing, the thing about David is he's got this kind of tenacity, hung in there for five years, being told it won't work, finding ways to make it work. And as a result of that, it will, he will win through and he will succeed. There is no doubt about that. So, so kind of what connects them together, for me, I suppose, is, is, is the fact that they are all people that were not content just to sit back and, and let it happen. They weren't content just to sit back and, and accept the status quo. They weren't content just to sort of sit there and, and kind of you know, let other people do stuff. They didn't sort of leave things hanging on trees. They, they do something kind of different. And, and, and David, of all the people, said to me a couple of days ago that the, the one thing that really made him <coughs> to hang in there was the fact that when, when he got a lot older, he didn't want to look back and say, I didn't do anything. I wonder how many of us, a bus, think like that right now. How many of us could take that step and do something that we mm -hmm. haven't done before? How many of us have a passion for something, have an anger for something which actually isn't being done or isn't being done well? Or somebody somewhere has told us it's being done correctly when we know deep down it isn't. And how many of us are actually going to take that first step and, and make that thing happen? And I suppose that the, the other thing for me is that when you start to look at the things that, that bug you, I'm just fall them off and I get back again, and, and you kind of explore them, they're not really as scary as the kind of first thing. kind of have a rummage around. And there are people here that know I have a reputation for throwing sweets, but I won't do it. <laughs> and it's just like a little lump of 
<laughs> so the message, the message there really is that when you, when you actually confront the thing that scares the pants off you, the thing that everybody tells you to avoid and steer clear of, the thing that everybody says is just something you, uh, place you don't want to go, then actually when you get in there it's not half as bad as you first thought. So where does that leave me with you right now? I guess that's about thinking. So, so what I've tried to do is, is, is to set a scene. I've tried to illustrate with very ordinary people, ordinary backgrounds, how they've kind of just done what needs to be done. Uh, and I just wonder how many of us, as I said earlier, how many of us actually will do that stuff ourselves? How many of us will, will make that step? How many of you have done one of these uh, training courses? I did Common Purpose a few years ago with the people in the room. And, and it's all about what you can do to change your world, and half the people go away and do nothing. Half of those are there, think about it, and do nothing. And, and three people do something. And, and yet, it, it kind of is, it all, it, my spirit says that, that when you are that person, you start, <coughs> and other people do quite quickly follow, as, as, as the thing on the screen kind of showed. So my message, I guess then, just, just to, to close just ahead of, ahead of time now, but just concerning having that clock up there. <laughs> is, is that yeah, what's what's the message? The message is is, is, is frankly just do it. The message has to be just do it. There is, there is no other message. Um, and councils actually want to do it as well, but we'll never say so in my experience. <laughs> yeah, uh, big organizations can't do it, they can't move fast enough. They kind of quite quick to follow once you start doing something. Um, I've got the examples around Norwich now, but when we all walk out of this, this, this room, we walk up those stairs, and we walk out into the into the rain of the wonderful Norfolk Spring, and we'll think, well, what 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 about those things? What things you see that you think you can change? And bear in mind that the world is has kind of changed out there. So all this big society stuff that government talks about, and all this localism, is like a, a toolkit of legislation that enables this stuff to happen. So the other thing about right now, in the same way that, that that creates a degree of urgency around mortality, there's also a degree of urgency around, well, now's the time to do it, because actually now you can do it, now you can make it work. And, and everything's there to make it possible, whereas a while ago it wasn't. And I think that's me done. <laughs>